Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are truly privileged and honored tonight to host as our scholar in residence, Dr. Edith Eager. It is very rare that we are so fortunate to hear from a woman of such great stature and magnitude. A woman who, as you're going to hear her story, survived the worst atrocities known to mankind and turned her dark and bitter experiences into a source of goodness, kindness, light, and guidance for others seeking to find happiness and peace and serenity in their lives. And if anyone can stand up and say, I've seen the worst of humanity, but yet I believe in the best of humanity, it's our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Edith Eager. And I just wanna say before I begin how honored I am, a bit intimidated and overwhelmed to be able to speak with such a great hero in our time. And I want you to know, Dr. Eager, that in our house, we've read both of your books. Even our teenage children have read your books, The Choice and The Gift. And The Gift actually sits on my nightstand right next to my bed where I usually try to read a chapter at night before I go to sleep. You are truly an inspiration to millions and millions of people around the world. And I have to share with you one other personal thing, and that is that both of my grandparents, my mother's father and mother, Mendel and Henja Bosch, were also born in Hungary, in Sigit, and were also sent to Auschwitz. And they both survived, but tragically, many members of their family, including their parents, did not. And I grew up every Shabbat at the table with my grandparents seeing the number from Auschwitz on their arm. And my grandmother died just a few years ago, but she, was a, she would have been about your age. And so who knows, you may have known her, you may have met her once, and I could personally truly relate to your story. I'd like to introduce our guest speaker tonight, following which Dr. Edith Eager will give a synopsis of her story, of her life, of her books, and then we will have a question and answer period. And I welcome anyone to type their question into the chat box after her presentation or during her presentation, and we'll try to address as many of the questions as we can. And so now for a brief introduction. A native of Hungary, Edith Eva Eger was just a teenager in 1944 when she experienced one of the worst evils the human race has ever known. As a Jew living in Nazi-occupied Eastern Europe, she and her family were sent to Auschwitz, the heinous death camp. Her parents were sent to the gas chambers, but Edith's bravery kept her and her sister alive. Toward the end of the war, Edith and other prisoners had been moved to Austria. On May 4th, 1945, a young American soldier noticed her hand moving slightly amongst a number of dead bodies. He quickly summoned medical help and brought her back from the brink of death. After the war, Edith moved to Czechoslovakia where she met the man she would marry. In 1949, they moved to the United States. In 1969, she received her degree in psychology from the University of Texas, El Paso. El Paso. She then pursued a doctoral internship at the William Beaumont Army Medical Center at Fort Bliss, Texas. Dr. Eager is a prolific author and a member of several professional associations. She has a clinical practice in La Jolla, California and holds a faculty appointment at the University of California, San Diego. She has appeared on numerous television programs, including CNN and the Oprah Winfrey Show, and was the primary subject of a Holocaust documentary that appeared on Dutch national television. She wrote her best-selling book, The Choice, in 2017 at the age of 89. She is frequently invited to speak at engagements throughout the United States and abroad, and she is famously known as the ballerina from Auschwitz. Ladies and gentlemen, Palm Beach Synagogue and our entire community is honored to welcome tonight, Dr. Edith Eager. Start again, start again. Thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. I hope we're going to have a very productive time because Chabad 
and I have a love affair. I was born, as you know, um, in 1947, so I'm 93 years old. But uh, You were born in 2027. 1927, yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so um, I don't care about the chronological age because when I was 40, my supervisor told me to get a doctorate and I told him it's impossible because by the time I get the doctorate, I'll be 50 and he told me you'll be 50 anyway. So I think I'm telling you that too, that some of you are maybe in uh, recognition that there are no problems in the world. There are only challenges and there are no crises. There are only transitions. And now that we are locked in, I hope that you take your time and take stock of yourself and recognize that the Chabad people are the best, the best of the whole fully telling you that I have a son who is totally beautifully cared for by the Chabad. And uh, you just don't say one thing and do another. And love is not what we feel, is what we do. So it's important for me to look at that beautiful synagogue that you have and that you build. And uh, one of the things I must say to every time I speak to anyone, I don't need to tell you that, but unfortunately, we still have genocide as we speak but never in the history of mankind, such a scientific and, and, uh, and uh, also significantly even um, the scientific way that 15 highly educated people decided that they can put 30,000 Jews in the oven in one day. And I am part of that final solution of Eichmann. My parents were very creative people and uh, they had two daughters before me. My sister Magda, who's going to be 100 years old Saturday. But unfortunately, when she came to America, she cut off one year. <laughs> Hungarian women, you know, do that. <laughs> and so she thinks she's 99, but I know that she was born in 1921. My other sister, Clara, in 1924, and I was born in 1927. So my parents really wanted a son, and then I showed up. I don't know, some of you may have also had that story that your parents wanted to be um, fathers and mothers of a little boy, and they got a little girl, or vice versa. My mother looked at me very seriously, and I may have been seven, eight years old, and she said, I'm glad that you have brains because you have no looks. So I think today I'm going to ask you to see what kind of stories do you carry with you that may have nothing to do with what's going on today, and it's called unfinished emotional business from your family of origin. The work I do that I take your precious hand and be going on a journey, on a journey because you cannot heal what you don't feel. And yes, we Jewish people are capable of crying and what comes out of our body never makes us ill, but stays in there does. So when I met my boyfriend, I have a picture of him on my computer. I see him every day. We were very dedicated to Judaism. We were going to go to Palestine together. We had a dream together. Are we going to go to Palestine? And we belonged to the Batar. We were very militaristic, I want you to know. <laughs> And that was our dream. And then there was a knock on my door and that's what happened. I was taken from my 
from my city, Kasha, Hungary. When I was with Elie Wiesel, we decided that we were on the same transport in May 1944. You may want to check into that. And I don't know if uh, that is true or not. But I grew up just one, like my mother told me, to study, to study, to study. And when we came to America penniless and I didn't have $6 to get off the board and I didn't speak a word of English and you spoke to me and you wanted to know whether I understood. And I said, yes, even when I didn't understand the word you were saying. So my story is uh, a story of a woman who was determined to acknowledge that our ancestors didn't have it as good as we do today, but they never gave up. That there is hope in hopelessness. And that's why I am here today. And some people call me a spiritual midwife and I kind of like that. So all of you are pregnant now and you can give birth to the you that was meant to be to reclaim your innocence. So when I told my sister Magda that I wanna go back to Auschwitz because we lost our family and we, I never went to a funeral and she told me I'm an idiot. She told me I'm a masochist. So we were going through the same experience, very different responses. So it's not what we, th I think it's really what we do. I was really in love with Eric. I call him now Eric. In Hungary, his name was Imre Friedman. And Imre Friedman told me as I was put on a cattle car that I never forget your eyes and your hands. And that's what I would do in Auschwitz. I would ask everyone, tell me about my hands, tell me about my eyes. Because if I survive today, then tomorrow, I'm gonna see my boyfriend. So I hope that I bring you an opportunity to look at our time in our life, that we go through the valley of the shadow of death, that you don't come there or set up house or there. No, I never forget the past. I don't know what is overcome. I, I do not overcome. I'm reminded every time yesterday I was at Costco and uh, I looked at the barbed wires, but it's fleeting. I don't stay there too long. So I don't forget it. I do not overcome it. I came to terms with it. I call it my cherished wound. What did I do in Auschwitz? The darker were the situation, the closer I felt to God. And that's why I'm very proud. Mother of three, grandmother of five, and seven great grandsons. That's the best revenge to Hitler. That's the way Hopefully, we can see that uh, we Jewish people never ever look at anything other than an opportunity. An opportunity was in Auschwitz to realize that we had a choice to either react or respond. And people who, who reacted, they would touch the guards and they were shot right away. You know, Hans Selye, who was a Nobel Prize winner on the stress studies. He says, we have two automatic responses when we have stressful situation, we either fight or flee. And that did not work in Auschwitz. Because if I wanted to um, have freedom, I touched the barbed wire and I was electrocuted. So to fight or flee, we had to learn to respond rather than react. And I discovered God and people asked me, where was God in Auschwitz? God was with me. God didn't kill my parents. We're not born with hate. We learn to hate. 
we are taught to hate. So Jewish people are excellent, brilliant people. How to talk to yourself and listen to that sixth sense. And because that is a wonderful guide. So I am hoping that I can stay alive because I am giving you an opportunity, what is very important to have self-love, which is self-care, which is not narcissistic. So I'm hoping you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror, you think about your precious rabbi, and you say pretty soon, I'm going to decide what do I really want to be known for? How do I want to be remembered? And I see life as one day. The morning sunshine will not come back. I am at the evening time of my life. And I know that every moment is precious. So I hope I'm talking to the Palm Beach uh, people. I was in Miami. A wonderful community, Jewish community. And I remember the person who introduced me and the others, they were wonderful people. One of them was Mr. Katz. I still sometimes talk to him. And he told the audience that he doesn't read. But uh, he heard from the London rabbi recommending my book. So he, he read my book and that was the choice then. That was a few years ago. So you have neighbors there. And I told them that I fled the communists. Um, my husband's family owned a business in Czechoslovakia in Preshov. And the communists came and confiscated the business. And my husband, unfortunately, was talking back to them. And uh, yesterday's Nazis came in, uh, came, became today's communists. So they put him in jail. Now I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. I don't say why me, I say what now. And what I did, I took out my big diamond ring. I put this bracelet into my little girl's diaper. I went to the jail and we fled overnight. And in Vienna, we ended up at the Rothschild Hospital. What did you do with the ring, the big diamond? The, I gave the ring diamond to the warden, Mordida. So what I like to tell you that you may not know where your money goes. It may go to a young mother like me with a little girl a year and a half who is getting clothing and food and a place to live from your money. And maybe a young mother now is thanking you from the Rothschild Hospital because Jewish people are taking care of their brothers and sisters. So I hope that you feel good about you, that uh, we Jewish people give hope to people that everything is temporary and thank God that we can survive it. So we are good survivors. I'm not a victim. I was victimized. It's not my identity. It's not who I am. It's what was done to me. So it's very important for me because I think God wants me to be a good role model to you and let you know that after two beautiful girls, my son was born and my husband was so, so happy because he's going to carry the name, the Rabbi Akiva Yeager. If you go to Jerusalem, you see a city there where the name is going to be seen. But my son did not develop my, like my daughters. He didn't sit up on time. He didn't walk. He didn't talk. When he was four years old, I was told by five doctors that I may have to prepare my son to go to a school for retarded children. We don't use that term anymore. 
So I say America is a country of second opinion. Where do I go for second opinion? And I was told to go to Baltimore, Maryland, to Johns Hopkins. After one week, a doctor told me, your son is going to be what you make of him. And I am shaking there. And he said he's going to need speech therapy, occupational therapy. And he's going to be like everyone else. It's going to take him longer to get there. And I want you to tell me I gave up going to school. I went to the cerebral palsy clinic. And my son, John, graduated as a top 10 student from the University of Texas. And Chabad is really his second home. Now here, I live in La Jolla, California. There were no Jewish people allowed to live here. And the other neighborhood is uh, Rancho Santa Fe. And guess what? Now we have a Chabad rabbi in Rancho Santa Fe. So miracles are happening. You always find what you look for and what you think you create. So this is kind of where I am. And I am uh, happiest ever because I am looking at your precious faces and I'm looking at your rabbi, who I'm sure studied a lot, and he's still studying a lot and reads a lot. And many times he comes home very, very tired. So the Robertson is my hero because she is one who providing the home. She is the one who is making all the decisions, even though she makes him feel that he makes all the decisions. Just for watch Fiddler in a room. That woman is a woman of strength. She is not smart. She's wise. She's wise. So I'm talking here to women of strength, and I'm talking men who are the mensch. And what is a mensch? A mensch is a leader, a knowledgeable leader, not a dictator ever. The man is a role model to the children, the way he treats the children's parents. Mother. A mother, mostly, of course. And uh, so again, I am uh, so grateful to ask you to see how you can see the rabbi even more than just once a week and, uh, and see how you work as we did in Auschwitz, that we had to have cooperation, not competition or domination. All we had was each other then and all we have is each other now. So I'm sure that you grew up, if you are a firstborn child, and if you marry a firstborn, you have two bosses. You may have some power struggle. I don't know if you relate to that. I don't like to generalize, but middle children are usually um, Peacemakers, they want everybody to get along with everybody else. And you know how we, how we call youngsters in a family? Charming manipulators. I don't know if any of you were a charming manipulator. That's how we call youngest children. But again, you are you. And, uh, and I know the rabbi is ready to ask you to ask me any questions. Thank you, Dr. Eager. Your words are mesmerizing. Thank you. Thank you. And, Thank you. and mesmerizing. And if anyone would like to ask questions, please type them in and we'll present as many as we can. Dr. Eager, um, you're known as the ballerina of Auschwitz. Can you tell us the story behind that name? When we arrived in Auschwitz in May 1944, Everything was very chaotic, very, very chaotic. At the end of the line was Dr. Mengele. I didn't know who he was. He pointed my mother to go to the left. 
I followed my mom. He came, he grabbed me, he said, you're gonna see your mother very soon. She's just gonna take a shower and promptly threw me on the other side. He also asked me, is this your mother or is this your sister? And I never forgave myself. And I said, that's my mother. So what happened? I met with a couple, a fellow inmate who pulled my earrings out and I was bleeding. There was a lot of displayed aggression. She took her anger out on me. And she says, while well, you went to the theater, I was here suffering. And I told her, you know, I would have given you my earrings. And besides, when will I see my mother? She pointed at the chimney and said, your mother is burning there. You better talk about her in past tense. And my sister hugged me and she said, the spirit never dies. That's how I entered Auschwitz. And after a while, we were completely shaven. My sister looked at me and asked, how do I look? And I had a choice then, as you have a choice now, I like to bring the there and then to the here and now, to tell her how she really looked completely naked with the bald head. I was able to somehow tell her not what she lost, but what she still had. So I told her, Magda, you have beautiful eyes. And I didn't see it when you had your hair all over the place. So pick something that is really, you're not lying either. Just point out what is still there, what is still left, what is there for us Jewish people because our ancestors didn't have it as good as we do, I guarantee you. And they never gave up and we carried that blood. So I'm a very proud, very proud Jew. And Chabad is all over the world, taking in people of anything and any kind and whatever it is, you're completely taking in totally non-denominational everyone. And I, I know that I love you very much to be with you, to promote Chabad, to know that you are the ambassador for peace and goodwill. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Eager. Someone asked a very practical question. Do you still take private patients? Of course. People are not coming to me, they're sent to me. So there came once 14 year old boy and he told me he's a boot boy and I acknowledged uh, his boots. I don't know anything about boots. And then he got up, he put his elbow on my desk and he said the following, hey, hey doc, America has to be white again. I'm going to kill all the Jews all the N-word, I don't even want to say it. All the Mexicans and all the Chinkos. Now there is a difference between reacting or responding. If I would have reacted, I would have taken that young boy, drag him to the corner, probably step, step on him and tell him, how dare you talk to me like that? I saw my mother going to the gas chamber. But just like in Auschwitz, I went to God and I said, what is the meaning of this God? I am not a bigot. God said, find the bigot in you. I said, I came to America penniless. I work in a factory, 1949. I went to the bathroom, one of them said, colored. And after Nazi Germany and communist Russia, this is what I'm facing. So I joined the NAACP. Yesterday I was celebrating Martin Luther King. I was in Washington in 1963 singing 
with the mamas and the papas, we shall overcome. And that was way before you guys here. And uh, I'm very, very committed to see how we can really just uh, unite that I can be I and you can be you, but together we're gonna be much stronger. And everything begins with you. We're born alone, we die. There is something between birth and death called life. You are doing your calling, Rabbi, and I am doing my calling. I feel very blessed when I can guide people from victimization to empowerment and to be able to really just recognize that uh, I had a choice with that young boy and I created an environment as you create that people can feel any feelings without the fear of being judged. And I looked at him and I said three words, tell me more. Love is time, T-I-M-E time. And you know what? People will tell you what's all ailing them. And I work with a medical school. I work with a new wonderful uh, uh, women and men. Uh, and you know, they tell us now that they don't medicate grief. Grief is not an illness. It's a natural reaction to a loss. So we have it good. We Jewish people cry a lot. When the children come, we cry. When they leave, we cry. You know, it's very good because what comes out of your body will never make you ill. What stays in there does. So share, share your secret. I didn't tell anyone I was in Auschwitz. I just wanted to be Yankee Doodle Dandy. And uh, thank God when I read Man's Search for Meaning. And also Philip Zimbardo, who writes the foreword, was telling me that the people who survived and are famous are all men and they needed a female voice. So the choice is uh, the female voice of Viktor Franco. But he was 38 and I was 16 in Auschwitz. So we came at different time. And then when Dr. Mengele en entered the barracks, he wanted to be entertained. And my friends just threw me in front of him. And he said, dance for me. And I closed my eyes. And I pretended the music was Tchaikovsky. And I was dancing the Romeo and Juliet. And that's what Victor and Frankel and I have in common. And he said, he also closed his eyes when he was beaten and pictured himself in a Viennese lecture hall, lecturing about the psychology of the concentration camp. We used both the same skills to check out and to be able to let go of the need to do anything just to get through this and never allow ourselves to react. And today you just take a deep breath because Akma Dijidad said the Holocaust didn't exist. And Plato said that you have to think of a lie and it has to be a big one. And then you repeat it, repeat it until people believe it. So our enemy is ignorance. Question authority, when I go to your school, I want the children to look at me as a good role model to them, that they are the future ambassadors and they are going to be the presidents of the United States, that we're going to unite and get rid of the us and them mentality because we're born, I think, as a seed and God doesn't make junk. Young tell me that young people, I love them that they tell me that God doesn't make junk. I love that because self-love is self-care. It's not narcissistic. Love yourself, be a good mommy to yourself. Ask yourself, is this good for me? Is this gonna empower me or deplete me? Do I wanna feel soft and warm or cold and safe? You can really 
take your temperature several times a day and see how you can be truly a survivor. I see a doggy, the kind I just used to have, Madeleine. I used to have a little dog and the French woman called him Gary Cooper because he had red hair. So you have one of those. I want it, I want it, I, I want your doggy. I love dogs. Beautiful. Dr. Eager, when you look around the world today, do you feel yes. that you has made progress? I think it's like climbing a mountain. We climb and we slip and we climb and we slip and we never stop climbing. I have yet to arrive. I'm still in a process and there is a lot in the shadow called Jung told us there are a lot of untapped potential in the shadow. I'll take you there. I want to guide you there. What happened when, when good people were believing that Jews are cancer to society? And I was told in Auschwitz that, that I'm subhuman and the only way I will get up here as a corpse. And they took my blood. And I asked one time, why are you taking my blood? And he said to aid the German soldiers so they can win the war and take over the world. I couldn't yank my arm away. I may wouldn't be here, but you know what I said to myself, with my blood, you're never gonna win the war. So I asked people to respond rather than react. When you react, you don't think. So I think, Rabbi, you are the knowledgeable, wonderful uh, uh, place where the buck stops. I, I, I was, I remember in Missouri with Truman and he said, the buck stops here. The buck stops here. So I uh, want to honor you to invite me and giving you an opportunity to rethink. And this is maybe intermission time that we're hoping to empower each other with our differences, that you can be you and I can be I, but together we're gonna be much, much stronger. Yes. So I hope I get to go to Palm Springs and uh, feel very honored to be in your synagogue and see how we can create a world that we can unite. We would, we would be honored to have you uh, visit us in Palm Beach. It would be no greater I, honor. Let me ask you I a question. To, you mentioned yeah. your faith in God and how people ask you, where was God during the Holocaust? And could you elaborate a little bit about your faith in God and how that sustained you perhaps during the darkest days of yeah. your life? I, I discovered my faith. You know, people tell me, I believe, I believe, I believe. I don't really keep pay attention to that, but I want to know what kind of life you lead. I want to know that what you're saying is, is true for you, that you are here in this world, living the present, because, you know, I can only touch now so I'm very interested in, um, in recognizing that my true faith in God came to me in Auschwitz. And I was praying, not for me, when we were in April 1945, when the world was really in chaos and people were starving, even the German people, we were told that we're not allowed to leave the premises because they, they're gonna shoot us. But my sister Magda told me that she's hungry and if I don't find some food, she'll die. So I went outside and I saw some carrots in the next garden. I was able to steal, I was a gymnast. 
I was able to jump and steal the carrots. And when I came up, I met the guy with a gun. And I thought I was going to die now because I heard the clicking maybe three or four times. And I began to pray, not for me, for him. And there was an eye contact. You know, I can kill you with my eyes. I can love you with my eyes. And he turned the gun around and pushed me inside. And I had my carrots. I gave it to Magda. In the morning, he showed up. Wanted to know who there to break the rules. And I climbed to him. I still see myself climbing to him. Crawling. And I, I said. Crawling. I was crawling. I didn't know how to walk anymore. And I told him it was me. I was afraid he'll kill us. And he gave me a loaf of bread. Do you know what a loaf of bread meant when, uh, when a piece of bread was uh, never anything like that happened to me? And I wish I could meet that man because he told me, you must have been very hungry to do what you did last night. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could meet that man today? I met the diamond. When I was talking to Larry King, he asked me, is it possible that you may have met kindness? And I told him that story. Yes, I did. Wow. They were kind people, and I met at that diamond. Wow. And that was before I was on a death march from... from uh, um, we were in a, in a line to be put and exterminated. And then they changed their mind. And we were on a death march. And when you stopped, you were killed and thrown into a gutter. But when the girls that I shared the bread with, that Dr. Mengele gave me after I danced for him, came and they formed a chair with their arms and they carried me so I wouldn't die. Isn't that amazing? That the worst brings out the best in us. Wow. That touches on something you write about, that you shared your bread with others and then those girls saved your life on the death march. And you talk about how... People who care, looked out for others in the camps did better than people who just looked out for themselves. Can you explain how? If you were just for the me, you didn't make it. We had to commit ourselves to each other. I remember when a girl told me from Yugoslavia that we're going to be liberated by Christmas. And Christmas came and went and she died. I think survivors are flexible. I'll send you a handout of mine. Many times victims can be rigid, all or nothing, love and, uh, and, and, and death. And it's very good for us to be able to really be in charge of our thinking, in charge of our feeling, and most of all, None of the positive thinking does any good unless it's followed with a positive action. When I work with teenagers, they tell me it's a good idea and I'm going to do it like I talk about procrastination. Okay. And guess what? I call them gonna people because they're always gonna, but they never are. So I think it's also a good question to ask, are you a perfectionist? Then you want to be more than human, not accepting that you're human, not accepting that you're gonna make a mistake. It takes a lot of courage to be average. But I like to tell you that there'll never be another you. Wow. And that yeah. is really exciting to me that never in a million years there is going to be a Gloria, a Madeline, a Beth, an Arlene, a Zayona, 
I love, I love your smile. Thank you. And I love your glasses and your lovely shirt. And William, and of course, Rabbi, I'm so, so grateful that God has chosen you and sent you to Palm Springs. So Palm you Beach. can be Palm Beach. Palm Beach. What did I say? Palm Springs. Palm it's Springs, okay. yeah. <laughs> Palm Beach, because you were sent there, your spirit is there, and anybody can come to you and feel any feelings without the fear of being judged. You are the wonderful role model of totally unconditional love. Thank you. Yeah. Eager. Um, you have so many people are commenting that you are so beautiful inside and outside and you radiate so much light and your eyes are so filled with love. Do you feel, I mean, it's clear that you're a very wise person. God gave you a lot of wisdom, but were you born with a sunny, positive disposition or is it something you worked on developing? Do you ever have dark days where you feel down or depressed when you think about the past and you have to pull yourself out of that feeling yes. and what what recommendation could you give to people who are going through struggles or have gone through struggles and they're haunted by it what are some practical ways and tools that you've ex uh, discovered to get out of that feeling of self-pity or sadness or depression you you sit down you take a deep breath and you invite the feeling in i have a feeling there is no way to have peace unless you learn to go through the rage. Don't cover garlic with chocolate. Don't say, oh, yes, uh, it's not so bad. Don't, don't try to cheer up someone who is telling you that their little pinky is really hurting. And you say, oh, honey, I just saw a person who doesn't have any legs or arms, that's not going to make that person feel better. I think you need a person, you meet them where they are and keep their feelings company. And the way you do that in the English language, when someone is angry, you're going to hear the word you. When I go to school, I tell young people, when someone says you, you take a deep breath and you say, I still live in America, there is free speech. I cannot change what's outside of me. So the longer they talk, the more relaxed I become. You take the negative stimuli, turn it into positive, and say to yourself, I'm practicing my low frustration tolerance level. So I'm not a shrink, I'm a stretch. And I like you to stretch your comfort zone. I didn't ask to go to Auschwitz, but you are faced with situations. God forbid that you may find out that someone has the COVID in your family. And uh, you want to do everything you can that is humanly possible. So that's why it's good to get rid of perfectionism and it's very, very good to recognize that what you think you create. You don't feel first and then you think. We have a cortex that sits on that limbic system. I think it's very important to think about your thinking and pay attention what you're paying attention to. Any behavior you pay attention to, you reinforce the very behavior that you don't want anymore. So two things are important. Think about your thinking and pay attention, what you're paying attention to, and have a goal. I like to call it an arrow to follow because I know that I came to America on a ship called General House for displaced people. And when we were crossing the English Channel, it was very, very, very stormy. And we took some side road, but then he came back knowing 
that we're going to New York from Bremenhaven, Germany. So sometimes we need to take off and this is the time out period, I call it, that you're not going back, you have a new beginning. Beautiful. Because uh, when you got married, you married someone that you thought was going to be like Romeo and Juliet, and then you turned out that you maybe remember that you liked your husband because so he was so punctual. I'm talking about my husband now. We went to a party and I took my time to get ready and he's already in the car. When are you gonna be ready, you know? But if I had to be at the airport five o'clock in the morning or four, believe me, he was there. So what you resent many times, you appreciate at the same time. So that would be a good homework for you. What do you appreciate one time and then you resent the other time and see how you can really um, go to the rabbi. Um, shall I tell you a joke, rabbi? Yeah. Yes. So a couple comes to you and tell you that their home is very crowded very crowded and also the in-laws are moving in. And the rabbi said, do you have animals? Where are they? They're in the barn. And the rabbi said, bring them in. He said, but rabbi, we told you, don't question the rabbi. Bring the animals in, come back in a month. They come back in a month. How is it? It's terrible. Well, go home and take the animals back to the barn. They come back in a month and say, how is it? It's wonderful. You see, that you're so wise that you don't try to fight something. You don't try to forget something. You learn how to, how to find a way that it has a good ending. So I think it's very important for me to tell you that life is beautiful. I never forget what happened. And I am seeing something now as a new beginning, not going back. And we learn, it's easier to die than to live, I know that. I was very suicidal after I was liberated. But God spoke to me and said, if you die, you will be a coward. But if you live, you're going to be for something. You're going to be for life. You're going to be for passion, joy, and most of all, love. My definition of love is the ability to let go. Let go of the need to be loved by everyone. Let go of the need to please everyone. But most of all, let go of your perfectionism that immediately automatically lead to procrastination that holds you back. And then you can easily think that people are against you. So see how you can take charge, take charge and celebrate every moment in life and I know when I'm going to be in my deathbed, I'm going to be so grateful that I was able to show up for you today, that I'm going to talk about you tomorrow. I'm going to talk to another Chabad and another Chabad and another Chabad. So I'm so happy to come to you as a survivor and never a victim of anything, anyone at any time in any circumstance. Beautiful. Dr. Eager, can I ask you, in the book you talk about forgiveness, uh, your yes. feelings towards Hitler and towards Dr. Mengele. Could you elaborate a little bit about people who have I, anger or past experiences where they were hurt or wounded and how to forgive or when is it appropriate to give and forgive? I think forgiveness uh, 
I means to many people that I forgive you for what you did to me. I, I don't have such godly powers. I want to be free. So forgiveness is to me a gift that I give myself, that I don't live in the anger and hate because if I would do, I would still be a prisoner. I can only touch you now. I live in the present. No, it's not me forgiving the Nazis or they did to me. I don't look at things that way. I don't have such powers. But I know that if I carry the hate with me, I'm hurting myself. And I think God is love. Absolutely. Dr. Heger, what's the best advice you can give parents that they should teach their children what's the most important thing and what's the best advice you would give couples to strengthen their love in marriage that's thank you so much children don't do what we say they do what they see and i think for a couple to acknowledge that that they really are beautifully every morning get up and say, how can I make my wife stay easier today? Love is not what we feel, it's what we do. We are the role models to our children. That the children look at you and say, when I grow up, I want to be like him. But I don't see mothers and fathers the same way. I think I am the mother, I see myself as the earth that I hold you, I'm the first woman to hold you. But I don't see a boy with a father the same way. I think the boy looks at daddy in a more competitive way and says, I wanna be just like him or I wanna be everything he's not. So then he grows up and say, I chose to be a rabbi, even though my father wanted me to join his million dollar business. No problem, because he gives up the need for his father's approval. But when he says, I'm never going to be like him, if you want to prove anything, you're still a prisoner. That's beautiful. So uh, think, what, 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 what could we give our children to teach them how to be resilient when they faced? What did your parents teach you that gave you the greatest strength to endure? I think I had a ballet master and I think his father was a rabbi. And he picked me up. I was double jointed. I did a split and then they carried me out in a split. He told me that God viewed me in such a magnificent way that there is such a thing as ecstasy. I had no idea what it meant. In Auschwitz, I discovered that life is from inside out and not to wait for something happen outside of me. That kind of dependency breeds depression. And that's where I decided now I know what my ballet master told me, that my power is coming from inside and they can put me in a gas chamber any minute. They can beat me, they can take my blood, but they could never murder my spirit. And that's what you bring to palms. Beach. Beach, <laughs> not <laughs> palms spring. You have to clean up my English too. I am so happy. You have beautiful eyes. You have a beautiful smile. And I hope that you are truly a mensch as you are and as I experiencing you. You're a wonderful interviewer too. And I'm hoping we'll talk again. I hope so as well. You know, a number of people asked, uh, that they would like to receive a blessing, a bracha from you, if uh -huh. you could everyone on this call, because uh, you are a very righteous woman to have endured everything you went through and, and kept your faith in God intact. And at the age yeah. of 
93, you're devoting your time to educate and to guide and to inspire. You are truly a tzaddikit, and we would like to have your blessing, uh, which would be very meaningful to all of us. And my brocha is going to come now when we have Pesach. And, you know, I'm the youngest child. I was the one who was reading the Haggadah. And uh, so now I am coming to you as the great grandma telling you to keep on walking. Please recognize that everything, everything in life is for your greater good. And don't cover up your feelings with alcohol and the biochemical way. We are all grieving of what, not what happened, but what didn't happen. So live today, live in the present, be a good role model that you feel that God put us all here to give and take and give and take and tolerating differences that you can be you and no one can do the way you can do it. You can do it not like anyone else because you are unique, one of a kind. There never be another you. God bless you. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Edith Eager. This was the most beautiful message to end the evening. And um, we want to give you a blessing humbly that Hashem should bless you till 120, you should continue to have the strength to inspire people. And you merited already great grandchildren. You should already see the next generation. And as you said, that's the greatest revenge against Hitler. And you are a voice from the, you speak for the 6 million and we feel the presence of all the 6 million with you. And we feel honored and privileged. And we, we hope and pray that we can meet again uh, in, in whether on Zoom or in Palm Beach, we would love to see you again. You know, one of the most wonderful gifts that God has given us, the gift of memory. And I owe it to my mother. I owe it to my, my, uh, my wonderful people who died so we can live and never ever forget and never fight but to face what happens when good people do bad things. God love you. Shalom. Shalom Shabbat. and Shabbat Shalom to you and may Hashem bless you and I want to thank you and on behalf Habat. of whom who had such I a I think Victor yeah, Franco yeah. met Rabbi uh, in Poland. His name, the Hubbard people believe yes. in that. That Rabbi, Rabbi what's Schneer his name? Rabbi Schneerson? No, Rab the Hubbard. It's not coming to me. Uh, but you, you met Victor Go right. You, you met you, Victor you, Frankl. You, yeah, Victor Frankl and I became very close. I did the keynote address for his 90th birthday. Yes, I, I, what, I had what a was, wonderful. What, what was he like as a person? He was uh, very German. Uh, he spoke German many times when I wanted him to speak English uh, because. People were saving their money, you know, to come and meet him. Um, but of course, German was more natural to him. I, I, I think was human, but I know that he was a wonderful, brilliant role model, how to turn tragedy yeah. into victory. Did you mean so Rabbi, I, bad Rabbi in Vienna? I met no, did you say again the name? You're breaking up a little bit. Was it Rabbi Bitterman that she was referring to? The Chabad rabbi? No. No, okay. No, the, the one who's written up everywhere. 
from Poland. Okay. It, it will come to us, I'm sure, after right. we are done. But you see, we are one of a kind, and it's good to do it our way. Our way. I hope to be a good role model to people, but believe me, you do it your way, and you do what your sixth sense is telling you. See, the, the, we have genes that we cannot change. We have the environment. But I take the third, how to respond to the other two. So that's very important for you to love you. And I'm going to repeat that self-love is self-care. It's not narcissistic. Right. Narcissistic people don't like themselves. Right. I love the way in your book, The Gift, you say you should give yourself a hug. Yes. And Self and kiss Add a girl, add a boy. Give yourself an other girl, another boy. Yes, it's okay to love you. Look in the mirror every morning and say, I love me. And nobody can do the way I can do things. I am one of a kind. Your words will echo in our minds and in our hearts for many, many years. And we thank you very, very deeply and wish you only the thank best of health. So your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Thank you. Same to you. One last Another. question. Are you working yes. on your book? Yes, with my daughter is going to be on recipes. Oh. So it, yeah, um, I am looking for good recipes. Well, <laughs> I'm a Hungarian cook. My daughter is a gourmet. Uh, she, she, she's, she, they don't eat in their home. They're dining. And, oh, wow. And, you know, but I, I, I make the goulash and I, I, I make comfort food. Wow. Do you bake challah as well? Um, my mother made a challah that I tell you it was an art piece. The way she did the challah and it was smelling all over the house. It, it was such an art, artistic way that I can still look at that challah that my mother made with so much love and so much joy. And she could take a chicken and probably make six meals out of it. She also fed a goose. I'm going to write in that book when my mother was feeding the goose every night with corn. Wow. And then we had the liver. Then we had the goose liver. Amazing, amazing. Well, we're looking forward to that uh, recipe book. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You and much. Right. evening, and thank you again. And we thank everyone for joining. This is a night we will always cherish and remember. Thank you. Bye Me bye. Too. Have a good night. Thank you very much, everyone. Shalom. Good night, speaker. Thank you so much. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.